Try it now. Is this any better? Same thing? Maybe it'll work for them better. We're good to go. Okay, great. Okay, this section is called Grain to Bread. Uh, we talked this morning about the importance of growing our own grains. And I'm going to talk about grains kind of generically here. Uh, there's different kinds of grains. Some grains that grow best in the wintertime, grow best in the summertime. Uh, for wintertime, uh, probably wheat, barley, that's a good illustration there. Summertime, corn and rice, so on. Corn does frost. Uh, if any of you are interested, uh, just I'm just sharing this because something I found out recently. Uh, there is a guy, I think he's in the Plains, area, Plains States area, but he went around and gathered over 90 different varieties of native corn, like the, that the native were, natives were growing on the different reservation, Native Americans were growing. And he grew them all together so they, they would cross-pollinate. And anyway, at, and from that process, developed a variety of corn. It's called Painted Mountain, and you can get it from almost all of them, in the, all the different seed suppliers anymore. Uh, Painted Mountain corn is supposed to be the most frost-resistant. Okay, it can handle a little bit of frost, which other, you know, frost will totally knock down most corns. Uh, this is like a flower corn, um, not corn on the cob, eating corn necessarily. Although, uh, one of the first corns I grew was some Indian corn. I don't know what variety at all. Might have just been something I picked up at the grocery store, you know, holiday time and just planted the seeds in my garden next year. But I would go out and eat the corn raw, you know, just pick it off the stalk and eat it. And, and that's pretty good. So that's where they got the idea of doing sweet corn in the first place anyway, probably. Uh, but anyway, this painted mountain corn is like a short season, and it does have a certain amount of frost. So that might be helpful to you all up here in this country. Anyway, uh, I'm going to focus mostly on wheat uh, because I like growing wheat. Uh, I like growing barley, too, but I've been as successful with the barley. Uh, several reasons for that. I'm not going to get into all that now. And Becky's telling me to hurry so she can do the Dutch oven thing. So <clears throat> anyway, the reason I like growing wheat is because our climate down there is, um, it starts raining about late October, November, mid-November, sometime during there. And then we'll get rains consistently throughout the winter. And then long about May, they'll stop raining, and it won't rain again until late October, November. So summers are hot and dry, and everything dies, okay, except for like the trees that have the roots going way down. Okay, but in the wintertime, all sorts of stuff will grow, but it's also the time that we have frost. Well, wheat doesn't care about frost. And so I can work in, you know, they say plant in October, uh, work the ground up. So to plant the wheat, just work the ground up. How are we going to work the ground up? Toss it out, okay, like the sower revival. Work it in. Get in. Come and eat it all. Break it in. And just let nature do its thing, okay? The wheat will sprout, and it's a, you know, larger seed than most, and so it's fairly vigorous, and it'll crowd out the weeds, so you have minimal weed problems if you got your spacing right, and it'll grow. Long about June, mid or mid June, just this time of year, it'll be ripe, and so basically, once you sow it, just let it grow. You don't have to do anything to it until harvest time. Harvest time, you have these so tall with heads of wheat on the top, okay? We'll be passing some of these out here in just a minute so you get a better look. And I'm going to need some kids to help pass things around, so anybody who's interested in doing that, be thinking about it. Yeah, I'll get you in a minute. Thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> so what are you going to do, you know, with that? And so I had heard of uh, using a sickle, and I figured that's going to be bending way over. That's not going to be so comfortable for me, especially being a tall like I am. And so I also bought a scythe. Okay, a scythe like handles on it, and there's like a machete blade on the end of it, and you're going whoosh, like this. Okay, uh, that works good. However, as you're cutting it, it's scattering it all over the ground. And then you got to come and still bend over a whole bunch to pick it up. And so what I found is easier. All sorts of toys in there. Uh, is to use a sickle. The nice thing about the sickle, I've really liked using the sickle. Put it, you know, just kind of scoot it into a And they'll all. It cuts easy, especially that if it's dry. Cut it and then I put it in a pile or just set it here and then I'll cut some more, stick it in the same pile until this has to be a big enough pile to make sheath or you know, do whatever you're going to do with it, take it somewhere else. So that's the way I've done that. The other way I've done it is just go pick off the heads and stick them in a bucket. Uh, not as efficient. This works way better. The hardest part with this whole process is threshing it. Okay, back in the day, they would thresh it but they had by hand, but they had a whole team. Okay, if you got a whole team, yes, that's efficient, labor efficient way, you know, worth it doing it that way. If it's just one person, it's not so good. Uh, what they would do is they'd have people with flails, and they're, you know, they'd lay a bunch of she's, uh, the heads in, a whole row of them, and there would be people bringing in, taking the old stocks out, bringing more sheaves in, and so on, until you get this pile of, and if you harvest at the right time, if it has the right dryness, you hit those sheaves and they, and they scatter, and the grains will just scatter, and everything separates out just fine. Uh, then on a mildly you take that outside and toss it in the air, and the air blows all the chaff away, and pretty soon you're left with pretty much pure rain. Well, that works good, but you need a team of people to make that process work. You're trying to do it by yourself, not so labor efficient. And so what I did, because again, I was working by myself. I got a bucket. I just happened to find this online somewhere. Get a bucket. Have a whole, uh, lid for it, have a whole hole cut in it, and I made a yes. okay, piece of rod that's threaded and put some chains there. These chains are just the right length for inside the bucket, and hook a drill up to this, and that whizzes around, and you put your heads. That's one of the reasons I would just pick the heads off, because I would have to pick them off anyway once they were on the sheaf after I brought that in. Uh, thrashing it this way and then just run this in the bucket you have to kind of judge the right amount in there uh, but this whizzes around and hits them and then they shatter and then you still have to winnow it um, what I found works good for winnowing is I you know, like these square fans you know and just kind of pour it gently over that and catch it on a tarp over here the chaff will uh, that's the way I'd do it now. Once no bio cell hits, we'd be waiting for it to get windy and then, you know, do it in the wind the old way. The other way is put your grain and chaff, you know, that's all when it's been thrashed, it's here. And you can kind of toss this up in the air uh, in a little bit of breeze. Um, the Orientals have like a larger basket. It's called a winnowing basket. And you kind of toss it up, toss it up so it does this kind of curl back and then you catch it again. And as it's up in the air, the wind will blow the chaff away rather than doing it with shovels and stuff if you have a great big pile. Yeah. Yes. 
Except when you're not able to buy or sell, the fan's not going to work so good anymore. So after you winnow it, then you have grain. Now you can grind the grain and do something else. Okay, so what we're going to do now, uh, those of you kids that want to help me pass this stuff around, I need two people to pass these around, the seed heads, and a couple other people to go around with bags to get the mess so that we don't make a huge mess here. In the, uh, remember the story of Jesus and the disciples going through the wheat field and the disciples were picking the heads and thrashing it in their hands? Well, you can do that. And what I'm going to have you do, give one of you, give you this one, and I'll give you this one. Um, encourage people to break them in half before, before it leaves the bag, because so, this is going to make a mess. This to each person, okay? You do that. Why don't you start on the other side over here? Yes. Um, I'm not sure how many people you're talking about. I'll, I'll just give you what the measurements I did. Uh, what would happen is I've, I've got a hold of this grain. Oh, you want to be on this side. Okay. Um. I got a hold of some grain. I went to the hard, uh, the hardware store, the health food store, and bought soft white wheat. Now, people that are into grains and bread making, they know that certain types of wheat are good for certain things, and they get real picky about that kind of stuff. I'm not worried about any of that, okay? I just want to be able to grow some grain so I've got something to eat. Um, anyway, I, that's how I started it. And, and I did just what I described for about five years. And this is the last year. This, these grade heads are probably three years old-ish right, right, right now. That's why they're just a little bit old looking. Uh, but the grain in them's fine. Soft. Yeah, well, this is soft. Now, the reason I chose wheat and tried to want it, to eat it straight, it broke so that when they hit it with the machinery, it would shatter. And so using, you know, high volume, high powered machinery, that's a very efficient way to do it. Except that's not the scale that we're doing stuff. I think the older varieties were all softer. Okay, I got the, the barley that I played with is an Ethiopian variety, and it's about the same softness as this soft wheat. And I think, you know, the disciples going through, I mean, they weren't breaking their teeth on that stuff that they were thrashing that day. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure they had soft wheat. And soft wheat is fine just to eat. Okay, as you will find out. Go ahead and thrash this stuff. I need a couple other kids to, to come back to help me too. Okay, they're making the rounds, doing their job. Yes, I see two guys stand up in the back. Come on up here. So, I mean, what, what soft tweet? Just go around and click a little... Find the top here. <laughs> Yeah, it's at the bottom there. Okay. Yeah, just open that up and... Okay, thank you. Well, why don't you, yeah, go around once you start over there. And... There we go. Okay. We're eating. I'm probably soft. Sure that... Uh, this grain that I have here now, I know is non-GMO. So I wanted something that had that versatility, so I could just eat it straight if I wanted to, rather than having to grind it. Also, the softer wheats are easier to grind by hand, which we're going to play with here in just a little bit, too. 
So you kind of get the picture, okay? You can thrash this by hand the way the disciples did. That works. Um, it's not a very efficient way to do volume. But we've talked about how we can do volume more. So with okay, a bunch of wheat grain. Make a huge mess. In Thank you, guys. Okay, so right now this is all apart because I cleaned it up from whatever we was what we used last. Um, so you're going to get to watch me totally put this all together if you can. Okay, those of you standing, I'm mean, sitting in the back. If you want to come and get up here closer, I'm going to mount it on this little bench. I'm, um, and I'll. too. Notice these, you see this, it has these little notches here, you see those? If you just clamp it as you're grinding, you lose a lot of energy. So I got a couple little uh, lag bolts. So, Oh, this part's already together. Good. I I should say this. We have those country living mills. Okay? It's still in the box. This is what I end up grabbing when I want to grind something. Just because it's so quick and easy. Um, I think the country living mill would work better, be more efficient, but for the small batches that I've been playing with, uh, this works plenty good. And like I said, it's quick. Newer mills, I, I really want to encourage you to get a hand crank grain mill, okay, as far as a piece of essential homestead equipment, that's one of them. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this whole demonstration. And the charcoal, so you have one of these kind of mills. Fortunately, uh, some friends of ours got one of these, and I was looking at it, and the plates are much, the, the teeth on this are much taller. And so basically they're just cracking whatever they're grinding rather than, gr you know, baking it into a powder. And so if you get one of those, and again, I'm aiming you towards the Corona grain mill. That's a Corona corn mill. That's what it's called online. Just plug in Corona corn mill and, and this will come up. Um, anyway, they've been like the best for many years. And we got this a long time ago. Uh, but the, like I said, the latest ones I saw were like that. If that was the case, I would get somebody with, that has a good grinder or like a belt sander uh, where you could sand or grind those teeth down so that they're flatter, so that you get a finer grind. Otherwise, it's just being cracked and you'll end up with like cornmeal. Okay. So... This has some little screws. Oh, they're not in this bag. Here they are. Does anybody have a multi-tool with a Phillips screwdriver on it? I could use that right now. 
Yeah, just bring it up. I had a set of screws for this that it came with that were like a flathead screwdriver, but I lost one, and so the ones I got to replace were, uh, were Phillips. Put a little Phillips screwdriver in this bag, this box yet. Thank you, sir. There we go. I will give it back to you directly. There you go. Thank you. Yes. What did you say about grinding those things down? Grinding these flatter. Some of them larger. Yeah, like I said, the the one that I saw that my friend got recently, the teeth were very tall still. And if you want a finer grind, you're gonna have to grind that down. Which is what I would do with it. I'm kinda of surprised they didn't sell it. I mean this is the way this one came. You know, I don't know why they don't make them that way anymore. Seems like an awful lot of work. Do you want to eat? Well, here we go. Sometimes the simplest solution is the only one that will work. And because of uh, what we have available to us now in our culture, we're used to very complex solutions rather than simple solutions. However, when we're in abject poverty situation like we read this morning, we're going to have to go back to the simple solutions because that might be the only thing we can make work. And I'm going to illustrate that here in just a minute. This will work for corn too, yes. Yeah, in fact.
kind of uh, be how fine the how fine the the flour is that we end up with. Okay. All right, there it goes. Uh, Okay, we're ready to go. Oh, one more thing. Okay, anybody want to come and turn the grinder? That will catch the grain, I mean the flour. Yeah, he... I'll just put that much in there. Cause it's uh, just starting out, so it's going to be... It's not going to be as smooth as it will be once it gets gets going better. I might need to uh, readjust the... Uh, I might need to readjust the, the fineness. Yeah. Here. Let me just let me do it just a little bit at first here, then I'll let people do it, get it adjusted right. Oh yes, this is way this is way too stiff right now. Hard wheat would be even harder, yes. Okay, this is this is coming out very fine. That's very fine. Yeah, let me let me back this off just a little bit. Because that was really hard to turn. Yeah, it was. No, it. You know, I should have adjusted this first before I even turned you loose on it. Yeah, can you grind the dried corn in there? Pardon? Yes. Um, depends on what kind of corn you're using, I think. Is that easier to grind now? This is better. I want to make it easier yet. These kids won't be able to do anything with that. What was the question? Can you get a good one of these at Neiman's? I believe so. In fact, that's one of the places I would look. Okay, whoever's going to grind this, it needs to go this way. Okay, you bring it backwards and it's going to pull the grain away from the plates. You'll notice there's an auger in there, like a screw thing that just keeps scooting it that way. So you got to grind it this way. I'd like to try it now. This is a little bit stiffer than I would like. But I'd rather have it a little bit stiffer than not stiff enough. And let me, there's a little bit of charcoal in here somehow. Let me get rid of that. Okay, you might try that. Yeah, a lot easier than it was. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Whoever else wants to try. You want to try it? Go for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we need to turn every we need to turn this all around so the camera can see what's going on. Okay, stop. Stop just a minute. Hop off. Let me turn this around. Okay, what's going to work better, somebody else sit on here and hold it still, and then you can stand over here and crank it, all right? That'll probably work better. Okay. Somebody sit on there and then you are, can are, you, are you done, or do you want to do it some more? You're done. Okay, go ahead and sit on it.
You can. Yeah. Yeah, we're on the downhill side. Oh, yeah, you got some more. Oh, it slipped. Oh, that's what means we have to dump it all through there again. We should have saved the. Well, here, let's leave this until I get that readjusted. Oh, no worries. It happens all the time. I'm just sorry I didn't catch it sooner. a better locking device than what the Yeah, but you want to mount it on something really solid. Yeah. Yeah. See, this keeps wanting to slip. Anybody else want to play grinding? No, let me do it all. Okay. behind me okay I'm holding this here so it doesn't cut loose let me let me save this while I got it yeah there you go and maybe with this hand just hold this here so it doesn't sure. slip just it needs to stay there. It's going to want to flip towards me. Okay, so, so yeah. Test. I wondered about this. Test. He's hanging on the oh, Here. Can you do this? Hold on to this so it doesn't move. And, and that way you can put all your energy into that. Yeah, this floor being slippery doesn't help at all. Oh, it moved? If, as soon as it moves, that's... Sorry. No, that's fine. It, it slips out of my hand, too. It moves too tight. It loosens up and then lets the whole grains go through. There, I'll try tightening that up. That might work. 
better. Land you need to what? Grow oh, yes. Make sure I answer that question. I started to, and then we got carried away with other stuff. Okay. Yep, there it goes. Okay, let me grab that. That's the auger. That's, that's yeah, well, that's what that's what got ground out before. <laughs> so how long would it take you to grind 12 or 15 cups? <laughs> you want to do a little bit every day? <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and make a simple flatbread out of this so we complete the process. I think I've got enough. If anybody wants to play with grinding, you're welcome to. No. Um, yeah, it's, she back to the question, how much land? I grew probably from here out to the parking area, okay? Like the asphalt. A strip about, yeah, maybe as wide as this room, that big, okay? When I got, when I grew it, I was still, I thought I had a sickle, okay? When it matured, I couldn't find my sickle anywhere, so I had to order one. By the time that got here, and I thought, well, okay, once I harvest this, what am I going to do with it? And so, anyway, just, t it took time, and it was starting to get later in the year, later, late, you know, early fall already before I got around to harvesting it. And so I thought, well, I gotta get in there and at least harvest something before the rains hit because then it'll mold and it's not gonna be good anymore at all. And so I harvested an area from, let's see, one, two, three, about from like say here, about the fifth row back, square, okay? That's, that's all I got harvested. And I had that much and I winnowed that and ended up with about that much grain in the bottom of a five gallon bucket. Okay, that's the best I can do for you. Okay, so from an area about, you know, like the front part of the seating here, expect to get, what's that, maybe two gallons? Gallon and a half, two gallons? Um, which I think isn't too bad. Yeah. Okay, let's finish this whole segment up. Some of you cooks are going to wonder what I'm up to. This is working. I was afraid I put too much water there for a minute. And so here I have a ball of dough. This is just flour and water, no salt even, which would have been nice, but I don't have any in my box, and I should have asked for some, I guess.
You want me to add salt, huh? Okay. Oh, I got something else here first. This is a Komal. For those of you that are not familiar with this, it comes out of Mexico. Yeah, you can tell. Oh, it's been on an open fire. Let's do. That light? Yeah, that's lit. Okay. And I got over my fingers from the bottom of that. Comal, C O M A L. It's um, out of Latin American countries. It's their version of a griddle. Pardon. C O M A L. It's their version of a griddle. It's, it was easy and lighter weight than a griddle, so I'm packing it around. It is not. It's just sheet metal. I think that's all the salt I'll put in. I risk putting in too much. Uh, somebody who knows their way around this church, can you hook me up with a paper plate? to my local health food store uh, we have a really good health food store in Mariposa which is surprising for the size of the community that we have um, and I just got some from their supplier um, I should have copied all that information down off the bag I'm sorry Yeah, this one is just light, lightweight and easy for me to pack around. Oh, I'm looking for yeah, something I can use as a top drawer right here. Spoons and spatulas. Let's say some burnt fingers. Okay, because the grinder, you know, was slipping there, there's a little, some bigger chunks of grain. In fact, I see one whole kernel right there. <laughs> but that's the only one. Well, no, this is soft wheat, so that won't be a problem. This is just flatbread. I just call it flatbread. I mean, you can call it anything you want, I suppose, but... After this, it's all yours.
Okay, can I get some helpers to pass this around? Some of you kids want to help again? Or are they gone out to play and... They're probably watching my fire. Question, yes. Um, I think when we're living in abject poverty under no buy no sell, we're going to be very thankful for just something as simple as this. And as I said, sometimes the simplest solution is the only solution that will work. Okay? And, and so I'm trying to demonstrate that in addition to. You can get as complicated an answer here as you want. And all the above you want too, right? If you got it, that's great. But if you don't have it, this is a whole lot better than going hungry. Oh, better than a lot of stuff. Yes, ladies, you want to wash your hands here? There we go. Starting to get some color here. Yeah, could have used a little more salt. Oh well. Better too little than too much, right? You got your hands all nice and dry and everything too? Okay, I'm going to give you this. Uh, I need one more paper plate, whoever got the paper plate. Um, let this cool just a bit and then bring it up into little pieces about this big and pass it around to the people, okay? It's still hot. Here, you can go and start passing those around and then come back and get some more. I don't think that's done. That's the last one that got on the fire. Here's still really hot. That's got to be scorching. Don't burn yourself like I'm burning myself. Here. Here. Take this. Take that and pass that around. Oh, here she is waiting. Here, trade you. Yeah, turn fire on. Yeah, this is done. Okay. I'm skipping the whole. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, really? I, I don't think it was all even. Yeah. <laughs> That's what matters. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn this over to Becky. She's going to tell you what we're doing next. Saw it happen.
Did it? Did your microphone quit? Did it quit? Oh, I may have when I. In a You guys there? Can you hear me? No. Okay, here's the last batch. <laughs> Anybody not get some? He probably turned it off when he took it out of his pocket. Oh, oh I see. Want? Yeah, it's okay for seconds. Okay, everybody, can okay, you hear me? Plenty of bread. If anybody didn't get some or you want seconds, just hold your hand up. She's bringing them around. Uh, I got a question. Yes, yeah, question. Did you use any fat or did you just put it right on the skillet? Pardon? No fat. fat no fat. Put it right on the skillet. Okay, it's like simple, simple as I can that? possibly do it. Yeah. Question, or you have your hand up for her? Ask a question, wave it, okay? If you're just trying to get her attention, just hold it up there. Okay, you still got some more there. Go ahead, pass them out until they're gone. And if nobody wants them, I'll eat them because I'm going to have lunch yet. Okay, and then as soon as you get your bread, take a five minute break. And please, only five minutes because Jim talked a long time. And I got to teach you a couple more things, okay? And then meet, just meet right back here. Thank you.
There's my brother and sister-in-law back there. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, you're an awesome God, and we praise you for all your many blessings you've given us. Be with us as we continue the seminar and help our minds to absorb what you have for us today and help us be willing to be workers for you. And that I may ask it, amen. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> the question is we asked, why do we teach Dutch oven cooking? Because a lot of people think, well, what has, has, that, could, has that got to do with your ministry? Well, you can no longer have propane and have your nice oven at home and electricity. You can bake anything in these babies that you can bake in your house oven. So that's why we teach this. Now this is a 10 inch Dutch oven. You see it's got nice little legs on it. Now you can get Dutch ovens that don't have the legs. And it also has a lid that has a rim around it. See that? So it's made to cook outside with coals or in the fire. And so that's the kind you want to get for cooking during that period. Um, <clears throat> now, I, have, I only brought two of them with me. I brought my 14, and these are heavy. If you don't believe me, come up and lift one. <laughs> um, I can't lift it. So I've got a 14. I mean, this is a 12. I'm sorry, I do have a 14. I didn't bring it. I have two 12s. I have several 10s. And I just have some little ones, too, in a bean pot. I have a whole bunch of them. But um, anyway, so in here today, in this 12-inch, we are going to be cooking some garlic potatoes. And can you guys see that? And um, they'll take about an hour to cook, about the same as your, as your oven at home. And so I've already started a fire in the back. And so we're kind of going to go and start them in just a moment so they can be cooking while we're talking. Okay, I'd like to give, let you just at least sample the food. I didn't know how many people were being going to be here, so um, I only bought two Dutch ovens, so it's not enough to feed everybody a meal, but we can, you can at least taste the food. And so um, the rule of thumb, though, how much heat do these need? Um, you always think they need more heat than they do. Um, this is a 10-inch Dutch oven. So it would take, um, 2 times 10 is 20, so I would take 20 coals to put on here. Have you guys ever cooked with briquettes like barbecue? Okay, so we're going to use the briquettes as our, as our measurement of a size of a coal, okay? And so it would take 20 coals to cook a 350 degree oven, to make a 350 degree oven. And so you would put one third of those coals underneath and two thirds on the lid. And that's really important. If you put too many underneath, they're gonna burn, you're going to burn the bottom of your, uh, your food in the bottom of your oven. So you only want two-thirds on the bottom or one-third on the top. I mean, I'm sorry, opposite. One-third on the bottom and two-thirds on the top. And an easy way to do that is, like, say, 20. And so if you take 20 and spin it in half, that's 10 on top and 10 on bottom. Take two from your bottom and put on your top, and you're pretty close to that. Not quite, but close. So... <clears throat> Anyway, and this is a 12-inch Dutch oven, so how many coals would I need for a 350-degree oven? 24. You guys are quick learners. Great. And say, how many on your knee and how many on top? Yes, 8 and 16. Thank you. So we got a good math person over here, so that's good. So that would be a 350-degree oven. Now, if I wanted a 400-degree oven, I'm going to add another briquette for every 25 degrees. Okay, you got that? So that would be two more, right, to go from 350 to 400. And I would probably put one on the bottom and one on the top. Okay, if I was making a pie, I would probably put them both on the top instead of one on the bottom because they're more like, or a loaf of bread is more likely to burn on the bottom more easily. So, but this is potatoes, so it doesn't really matter. I could easily put one on the bottom and one on the top for a 400 degree oven. Okay, so let's just take a minute and go outside. I already started a fire and we're going to do that. But if I can get a nice strong man to carry these out for me, so I have someone to carry that one, someone to carry this one. Oh, he's going to carry them both. Okay. <coughs> 
couldn't find the things. Well, they're around here somewhere. I thought I left them right here. I think I lost my camera. <laughs> oh, he's outside. Okay. Okay, we're not going to stay outside very long, but we're just going to go right, just come around the lawn and kind of look over here. Excuse me, please. Okay, so what we're going to do, can I put these on the table? You can just set those on the ground for a minute. Okay, and so so for the big one, how many did you say we need them on the bottom? Eight. Eight. So we're going to take eight of these coals, and we're going to put them in a circle here on the bottom. Now you don't want to put them in the middle. You want to put them in a circle around the edge of your pot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What did I get? Nine? That's okay. We'll just leave nine. Gosh, we want nine because we're 400. We want a 400 degree oven for potatoes. Okay. And then we're going to just set this pot. Right? Does somebody want to lift this before I put it up there? Anyone want to see how heavy they are? It's heavy. They're cast iron. You can get these in aluminum, but I wouldn't recommend it. It causes Alzheimer's and the mother stuff, so I would use the cast iron. Yes, you may try. Just don't drop it. I bet you're stronger than I am, so he's good. Want to set it right there on top of that for me? Nicely done. Thank you. So I'm going to put it this way just a tiny bit. Okay, and so then we're going to put um, 16 on top, right? And so we're going to just do that. Well, good. Then you're going to learn something today. <laughs> we're going to talk about that again when we get inside. I just wanted to get this started cooking because we got about an hour for it to cook. And then we'll talk about all those specifics when we get indoors. So on the lid, I want to put it kind of in a checkerboard here. My hands are getting hot, though. Okay, anybody count those? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many do I have? Okay, so put one more. Actually, we want 16 because we are doing a 400-degree oven here. That one right there. Okay, does somebody want to put that other pan on top of this pan? Oh, cool. <laughs> What's in that one? That one has blueberry pineapple cobbler in it. Now, I can keep on stacking these way up if I want to. Um, but usually, if I'm going to do that, I'll stack more the same size or the bigger ones on the bottom. I've already got two today. Now this one's only 10 inch, so how many do we need on top for a 350 degree oven on this one? How many? No, 20 is not the top. That's for the whole thing. <laughs> okay, somebody who's a mathematician, tell me, what's two thirds of twenty? <laughs> okay, so it's about fifteen and a half. Our mathematician tells us, but we're gonna, we're going to go with um with four with fifteen. We'll go fifteen. Actually, I think that's. I think that's one too many. We're going to go with 14. Anybody count? Is that 13? 14. 
Okay, now that doesn't look like it's going to cook that, does it? Those few coals on there. And that's what everybody thinks. In fact, one of our first times when I was reading all about Dutch ovens and learning how to use them, um, I had my campfire and I had pulled some coals over the side and I had started my, I forget what, I think I was cooking biscuits. And I'd put them on the side over there and put my coals around it, under it and on top. And I went off to do something and I came back and my husband in the meantime had come by thought that's not going to cook over there and he put it in the fire and he burnt my biscuits he was in so much trouble so <clears throat> you think it doesn't you think it needs more heat than it does and then you're also tempted to peek in there every little bit and look and see what it's doing no peeking when you peek you're letting the heat out so no peeking until your time for being done is almost there and um, you can smell the food then you can peek not until then now um, when you're lifting behind you some tools, let me see those. <clears throat> okay, the others too. When you are using Dutch ovens, you need something to um, lift your lids with and to move your coals. It's nice to have a whisk broom also, which I did not bring, but that's okay. We can get by without it. Okay, so my 14 inch came with this. So when I lift this lid, I'm not going to lift it, but just a tiny bit just to show you. It, it lifts up kind of a little bit of an angle. See that? But this is a small lid, so I can lift it up straight with this one. Now, if I was to lift that bottom lid, that big lid with this one, it would probably tip. And then what's going to happen? Oh, that's going to fall on my food. We don't want that. And so you can get something like this. <coughs> my husband, my son-in-law actually made this one for me. I have a horseshoe, which you put that on there. Oops. Let me get it on here, like that. And you can lift that up real easy with that thing. Put it back on there. And I can even use that and dump the ashes off and everything, and it doesn't, it doesn't move. So, um... So you want something that you can, now you can buy something very similar to this with whoever, with people that sell Dutch ovens. But, and I know, I know you have places in town because my brother took me over here to, where was it? Where's Joe? Where's Cabela's? Cabela's or North 40? Yeah. Where is Joe? Is there anything in the box? What? Yeah, yeah garlic potatoes. We've got garlic potatoes in the bottom, and we have um, blueberry, pineapple, cobbler in the top. No water. You don't need water because things are going to cook. Um, you're not going to let any moisture out of your pot. You're going to keep the lid shut. There's a little olive oil. You always want to put some oil in your Dutch ovens before you cook with them. Put some olive oil. Just kind of coat it with some olive oil or coconut oil or whatever you like. Okay, let's go on back inside, and I'm going to tell you some more stuff about Dutch ovens. So, I used my Dutch oven once, and I burnt everything right away. Put, it right away. put too much heat. Is there a recipe book that's, that you recommend to help me learn how to do this? Um, I'll talk to you guys about that too. Pardon? You're really actually doing dinner here. That is so cool. No, actually, you're getting a taste. <laughs> Testing, testing, I think it'll work. Okay, are we all back? I'm sorry, yes? My son-in-law made it. Yeah, but you can buy it at, um, you, can, you can buy um, all kinds of different Dutch oven tools and wherever they sell the Dutch ovens. Joe, oh, where was it you took me to have the lodge? 
What was the store that had the large ovens we went to? The store that we went to that had the large ovens. Huh? What? Black sheep. I got it finally. Sorry. So we went to the black. He took me over to the black sheep store um, the other day at the mall, and they have the lodge Dutch ovens there with all kinds of stuff to go with them. Um, but you can go to them and a lot of other places too. Um, it's, you can pick up sometimes you can pick up the old. And those are really nice because they're super smooth. They're not like the ones nowadays that are poured into a mold. They're not as smooth. But if you can pick up like one of the old ones, sometimes they may be rusty. You just want to look and make sure the edges around are the same diameter. You don't want one side thin and one other side thick. And make sure there's no cracks in it. There's no cracks and the, the metal is the same diameter all the way. Then you can, you can clean up all that rust and re-season it and have a really good Dutch oven. So, <clears throat> in fact, one of my 12s I got because someone came to one of our classes and he had bought it brand new. He had used it once, left it out in the weather, and it was all rusty, so he didn't want it. And I said, well, you can clean that up. It's not hard. And then re-season it, and you'll have a nice Dutch oven. And he's like, I don't want it. You can have it. So I got a free Dutch oven just for a little bit of work, which isn't a lot of work. You just clean them up and then re-season them. And to season them, what I do is, is you can go online, you can Google it, and they'll give you all kinds of ways to do it. Some people, they put it in the fire and they burn all that rust off. <clears throat> Some take sandpaper and they sand it gently. Some people put acid in them and do them that way. So you can do them all, ways, all kinds of ways. Um, I usually give it to my husband to make him clean the rust off. <laughs> and he puts it on his, he uses his little, what is it, honey? His little angle grinder with um, a little wheel. wheel on it. And he smooths it all out with that and gets all the rust out. I wash it with soap and water, dry it really good. When the, After I towel dry it, I'll put it on the burner in my stove and finish drying it so it's nice and dry. And then I coat it with um, like Crisco shortening. And then I just put it upside down in my oven rack along and put the lid up there too because you want to do the lid also and put a foil underneath it because it's going to smoke. Or you can do it outside on the campfire grill, which is good because that way it doesn't smoke up your house. So if you're going to do it indoors, you need to make sure you open up your windows, turn your fan on above your oven and because it's going to smoke a bit. And just bake it for about an hour. <clears throat> And so that's how you season them. And then if you want to season them, they're good to go for a long time as long as you take care of it. When it just wait, whenever you use your Dutch oven, as soon as you get done with it, I don't wash it with soap and water. I just wash it with hot, hot water and, a, and one of those green scrubby things. And just get the food out. It comes out real easy. Dry it really well. And then I put a little light layer of olive oil on it and pack it away. So, what temperature do you bake, bake it at? 350. Bake them at 350 <laughs> to season them. <clears throat> now, if you go online and Google it, you'll find, finally find some different answers. <laughs> I know when I was first learning Dutch oven, I found all kinds of different ways to do all kinds of stuff. But um, they're really great to use. I've used them many, many, many times, um, feeding lots and lots of people. Um, <clears throat> I know at the school in Durango where my, um, my son-in-law used to work here, they're over by Portland now, but they used to be in Durango, Colorado for many years. He was a teacher there. And they had, their school was probably two-thirds non-Adventist in the school. And, um, <clears throat> and they had one family that was, had a chuck wagon, and they cooked with Dutch ovens. And every fall they would have a fundraiser for the students, for the school. And they would make this huge meal, and they had these huge Dutch ovens, much bigger than I could ever move. But they would cook all kinds of stuff in those, and um, people would buy tickets for the event, and they'd have pony rides and the whole nine yards, and raise money for the school that way. And it was really fun. It was a really fun thing for a lot of people in the community came to that. But um, Dutch ovens is a way of cooking that's been around for a really long time. 
And I think that if you try it, you'll find, you'll be amazed at how wonderful your food tastes. It doesn't get dried out. It tastes so good. And if you make, you can, if you make something like a lasagna in there and you open, you know, open it up and at the end, I think, oh, it's too wet. Just leave your lid off a minute. All that evaporation is going to go, and it's going to be perfect. So, <clears throat> um, but you can cook anything in your Dutch oven that you cook in your oven at home now. Usually you use just a little bit less liquid because you're not going to be evaporating it out as you're cooking. It stays right in there. <clears throat> a lot of um, hunters and um, people use them up in their camps to cook. They'll put like a big roast on and put it in. Um, and sometimes they bury them. They'll dig a hole. They'll put them in the ground, put some coals in the ground and put them in there and then cover it with some leaves or grass and then cover it with dirt and just let it slow cook all day. And then when they come back, it's all ready to go. But you can cook vegetables and stuff like that the same way. And so there's a lot of things you can do. Did you find my pans, honey? Did you find my little things? Pick up a, a, Dutch, a Dutch oven cover and there's some almost a pile of rags on the floor. <laughs> it has my stuff my Dutch ovens were in. Did you look in the front of the truck, and all around in the truck? I'll look in the truck. Well, I need it now, please. <clears throat> anyway, so um, there's different ways you can cook in your Dutch oven. I know um, one of the things that um, that I did um, that I really that I hadn't done before is uh, with parchment paper, and you just take parchment paper and put it. Or in your Dutch oven and then put your pie crust down in the top of the parchment paper and I bring the pie crust all the way up to the top of the pan and then put your filling in and fold your edges over you guys understand what I'm doing yeah. okay and you have a little hole in the center which is a vent hole in your crust and then bake your crust that way and then when when your pies done you just open your Dutch oven and lift the parchment paper out and set it on your plate and voila there's your pie ready to go and it's, it really cooks wonderfully. So um, when you can't, don't have electricity or you don't have um, gasoline, you can, you can bake in your Dutch oven. You can bake anything from enchiladas. We have enchilada casseroles we make. We make, of course, garlic potatoes like we're doing today. Make lasagna, pies, cakes, bread, all kinds of stuff. Yes. Oh, thank you. I wanted to address that. Okay, so you don't have to use briquettes to cook in your Dutch oven. You just need coals. So if you have your campfire, whatever you're burning in your campfire, you pull some coals off to the side and you make it. Now, if you use a hardwood like oak, your, your, cook, your cooking is going to be, your temperature is going to be more even and going to last longer. Now, if you're using something like pine or cedar, your fire is going to be hot and it's going to burn up quick, you know, so you kind of have to know your woods a little bit. But um, other than that, if you just kind of watch your coals and if you need to add more, you know, you have your, your bunch over here burning in the fire, you can just add them to your, to your ring of coals. Now, <clears throat> um, with that said, you also have to watch the temperature outside. Like today is a really nice hot day. And there's not hardly any breeze out there. And so I'm pretty sure that those, those coals that we put on there today are going to cook it for the whole hour. It's going to keep cooking. Um, although they could burn up fast if it's too hot. So we'll have to, we'll have to go out and check it a little while. But if you're cooking and it's very cold outside and it's windy, um, if you can make a wind break, it's going to help. Otherwise, your coals are going to burn up very quick. You know, just like a fire, if you're blowing on it, it's going to burn it up quicker. You're going to have to add some more coals. So you need to have some more coals getting ready to add to your Dutch oven so that um, you don't you still have fire. You don't get halfway through your cooking and say, uh-oh, my coals are all gone now. What? And I have to start new coals in the middle of cooking. You want to have those ready to go. Yeah, we usually use briquettes just because it's easy when we're traveling. Like now we're doing it out in your church parking lot area or sidewalk. And so you wouldn't want us really building a fire out there and, and heating up and <laughs> getting the, the wood coals. You have to wait a while for those coals to get ready. Briquettes are quick and easy for that. Also, if you're learning, if you're just learning your Dutch oven, how much heat to put on it, 
briquettes are a good place to start because that kind of gives you an idea of how much coals it takes for that temperature. And so that's always a good thing to do when you first learn, to learn briquettes and then start trying with other woods and that kind of stuff. Yes? Okay, we have some fire pans we usually bring with us, but we did not bring those. We, Jim was thinking, well, you're not going to be cooking, you're just going to be telling them about it. And I thought, well, no one wants to hear about food and not be able to taste it. So anyway, so um, we went down to, to Target um, yesterday, or not yesterday, yesterday was Sabbath, Friday, and picked up some pizza pans. <laughs> so that's what I'm using to set the fire on. But... Um, if I was, um, you could set it in the dirt if you wanted, but a lot of times if the ground's cold, it's going to absorb some of your temperature. Usually we put it on a metal pan and you can get them, you can use whatever you want. Um, our place we had in Mariposa that we had set up, we actually had made a table with fire bricks and we would cook our Dutch ovens on the fire brick table. And it was a really beefy table, had big legs that were like this wide you know because it was heavy because then we put down a layer and layer of fireboard and then the fire bricks on top of that so it was pretty beefy and then we also had a an earth oven that we had built there out of the clay from our property and so when we did our cooking programs we would also cook bread in the earth oven and stuff you guys only get a little portion of the class but but you can also cook the bread right in your dutch oven in fact, you can have wood heat in your houses. You can cook with your Dutch ovens in your wood stove. In fact, we, um, we had, um, my husband was the first one that wanted to try this. And I, I like to tell stories on him. And so <laughs> anyway, so he, um, he got my 10-inch Dutch oven, and he made himself some biscuits, and he put them in the Dutch oven. And then, and then at night, I would bank, I usually go to bed later than him, so I would bank the stove at night, and then we'd go to bed. This is winter time. And in the morning, you go out there, there's still a lot of coals in the stove. You guys know how that is, right? Especially when you're burning oak like we were. And so he, um, he, he put the Dutch oven on the coals inside, and then put some more coals on top. In a matter of a few minutes, his biscuits were burnt because it's too hot. Okay, so... The, I can't remember the whole sequence, but several times, and finally I says, honey, don't put any coals underneath it, because the coals, the, the bricks inside the bottom of the oven are already hot. You don't need, it's been, it's been cooking all night, so just put the Dutch oven right on the bricks. Push the coals all back to the back of the stove, and so that's what he did. He pushed the coals to the back of the stove, just put the Dutch oven right there on the bricks, and then put some coals on top. Biscuits came out perfect. So you have to just kind of play with it sometimes to see, you know, make sure you're not using too much heat. It's easy to use too much heat. You look at that and you go, that's never going to cook like that. It doesn't look like it's cooking, but trust me, it is. So, <clears throat> and so that's the only way you can find out is just by playing with it. Now, when you store your Dutch ovens, you want to store them. Um, I made little cloth bags to store my Dutch ovens. I recently bought this little thing. But um, <clears throat> also... Um, if you want to, like, bake a cake in your Dutch oven, what are, what are these? Bolts. Put those down on the bottom of your Dutch oven. And then just put your cake pan right on top for a little spacer. And then you can just bake your cake in there. Okay? And then when you get done, your cake, you just take it out and put it on your cake pan, and you're ready to go. You plate your plate, you're ready to go. So you can do that with lots of stuff. You don't have to cook right in the Dutch oven. Even though they're not hard to clean, a lot of people prefer doing something like that. Okay? You could do that for bread also. I usually don't. I like, I'm a, I like making sourdough. I make those nice round loaves. And I, what I will do is I will sprinkle the bottom of my oven with um, cornmeal. And then the bread comes out easily. I'll just sprinkle cornmeal on the bottom because it's kind of gritty, you know. And then I put my bread in there. And then I rise it in there, the last rise. And then I stick it, the lid on it and put the coals on it. And, um, and just let it bake. And then when it's done, it comes right out because of the cornmeal on the bottom. So there's lots of little tricks you can learn to do with that. I love cooking, so that's one of my fun things to do. Okay, back there. Um, another, another idea. Um, I was in Peru in the Peace Corps, 
And if you had to flee and you didn't have your Dutch oven with you? I, I can't hear anything you're saying. Really? I'm sorry. Um, I was in Peru in the Peace Corps. And another idea in case you had to flee and you didn't have your Dutch ovens with you, what they cooked to layer rocks, you know, dig a, a pit and put rocks there. And then, like, it was meat, they would wrap it with... Uh, leaves or and and then cover it with the rocks and have the fire on top of it and that's another way that you can cook to use it like a slow cooker right yeah that's the same way a lot of the far, the um the hunters do it that way a lot was there another question over here or comment no okay so um let's see what else are you talking about dutch ovens I just have a quick question. What, what are you using for spacers? What were those things? Oh, those are just bolts you use like in your for a machine shop or something. Nuts. Oh, nuts. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, big nuts. Okay. Nuts that you screw under the bolts. This is something we had available to us, and so we just grabbed them. <laughs> you could use pretty much anything. Well, not wood. It would burn up. Right. <laughs> But a lot of times you can even just get like a little cake rack and put down the bottom of your Dutch oven as long as it's the right size and it would work too. So, yes. What can you do if you have a Dutch oven that doesn't have any legs? Oh, okay. Um, honey, go outside and get that trivet. I left it outside, please. I'll show you. You can put it to what we call a trivet underneath your pan. And... Um, and we have some of those, so I'll show you what those look like. But you can also you can buy them. We have some that my husband made just out of rings of metal with little legs on them that you set your... And those are also nice to have around to put your lid on, because when you take your lid off, it's very hot. Sit on the table, you're going to burn your table. So you don't want to sit up in the ground and get it all full of dirt. And so it's nice to have some trivets or something to set your lid on when you take it off your pan. So that's good, too. But she, he went out to get some, so I'll, well, I'll show you. Yes, Joe. Black Sheep also sells the uh, legs for the Dutch oven. The little trivet it, thingies? Well, it's a, we, you and I looked at it. It's a round stand. It's a stand that your oven sits on. Yeah, we call them trivets. But, yeah, it's the same thing. This is similar to that. This is one that um, we picked up somewhere. But um, this is one of those. You just put that down. And um, actually, it goes this way, I think, and put your coals underneath and set your dish Dutch oven on top. So, there you go. <clears throat> or you could use it to set your lid on when you take it off. <laughs> so, so when you're doing that, your lid won't be flat with the edges. Do you turn the lid over then so you can put the whole the coals in? Oh, you're so I can like use it for a frying pan? Because you can put your lid upside down. And cook with it like a frying pan. Well, I, no, she's I was asking thinking. asking if they have a Dutch oven like the other one that we have that has the domed lid. Mm -hmm. Oh, the handle. dome lid. And no mm -hmm. feet. Okay, the dome lid ovens, the dome lid um, Dutch ovens are more for putting in your oven at home. You cannot put coals on it. But we have just by taking one of those rings and putting the ring on top, the metal ring, and you can put it on, it'll keep your coals from sliding off. So you can do it that way, and we've done that. Well, it's not going to seal. It's not going to seal to cook your food if you turn it upside down. Another thing you can do with your Dutch oven is, um, like, in, let's say you're at a campground and you can't have any open fires. You can make a fire right inside your Dutch oven and then put your lid upside down on top of it, and you can cook your, use it like a frying pan and cook your pancakes or whatever on your lid so that's something else you can do with them so they're, they're pretty easy and they're so versatile you can do so much with them just remember don't wash it with soap I don't usually wash it with soap if you do you might have to put a refinish on it another thing too like I'm cooking um, the blueberry cobbler in one and the pineapple that's really hard on your finishing your Dutch oven and I think in that particular Dutch oven I've done that probably the last 10 times I've cooked in it just because we've been taking it all around doing demonstrations and I cook the same thing in it. Well, that originally, eventually I'm going to have to re-season that because it's taking the, 
the seasoning off of it. So if your pot's not looking real black inside, then you probably need to re-season it. On the other hand, if you're cooking something like the garlic potatoes that have some olive oil in there, it's not a problem. It's going to stay seasoned. But if you put like lasagna in there with the tomato, that's going to take some of your seasoning off too. So you need to kind of keep an eye on that as you're cooking with them. Yes? Oh, yeah, there's lots of cookbooks for Dutch oven. And you can go online and Google cooking with Dutch ovens, and you'll get a whole bunch of recipes and all kinds of stuff. Um, some of the Dutch oven cookers are what they call purists. And they'll say, don't wipe it with a paper towel, and don't do this, and don't do that. Well, you can or you can't. That's your choice. But um, I think that's a little, gets to be a little bit ridiculous after a while. But um, anyway, so that's about Dutch oven cooking. So... Our food out there is going to take probably about an hour. I'm not sure what time we put it in. Anybody notice? About 3.15 or something? Uh, 3.15? Oh. Okay, so, all right, so I'm going to switch gears. Any other questions about Dutch oven cooking? No. Okay, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because I want to teach you about something else that's near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> How many of, um, of you guys use medicinal charcoal? Okay, some of you do. How many of you make your own medicinal charcoal? Make your own medicinal charcoal. Okay, so nobody. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I'm going to tell you a charcoal story first, just so you kind of want to make charcoal or want to use charcoal. Um, we were at a school down toward the bottom, in the bottom of Mexico once, at a self-supporting school working. And um, one of the ladies there, she had squeezed a pimple on her lip, and the poisons, instead of coming out, they went in further. The next day, her face was huge, swollen with infection. And so she went to the doctor, the local doctor there, and he told her, he says, we don't have any antibiotics. We're going to have to take off a portion of your lip because I'm worried that infection is going to go to your brain. That's what he told her. Um, I'm a nurse by trade, retired, but myself and another nurse that was down there, we says, give us 24 hours, we can fix this. And so we made a charcoal poultice, and we put it on her lip, and we left it on for two hours, and then we did a hot and cold. We had hot water in one, in one pan and cold water in another pan with a washcloth in each one. We put the hot water on for three minutes, took it off, put the cold for 30 seconds, the icy cold water. Did that, alternated that for 20 minutes and put a new poultice on. And then 20 minutes hot and cold. And then another poultice for another two hours. And we did that throughout the night. By morning, she was back to normal. It's no antibiotic, nothing else, just that. And charcoal is a marvelous thing. Mrs. White talks about using it many times. I know one story she talks about. Um, she had a man come to her with a boil, and she told him, she says, go to the blacksmith shop and get some charcoal. We think we have to have special, fancy, activated charcoal we buy at the store. You don't. So he told her to go to the blacksmith shop and get some charcoal and crush it up and bring it to her. So that's what he did. She made a poultice and put on it, and in a short time, he was all well. Charcoal is wonderful. We've used it many, many times throughout the years. We make our own. It's not hard to make. The difference in what we make and what you buy is theirs is activated. We call ours medicinal. It's not activated. What they do is they use a hard wood to make it, and then they hit it with an acid, and that activates it. Opens up the, uh, what that does, it opens up the pores in the wood. Well, we use a softer wood that already has open pores, and that's what we do, and we, we, we cook that, and it works just fine. So we've been using it for many years. <clears throat> and so what you need to make charcoal, I'm going to just tell you how to make it so you can make your own because one of these days you're not going to be able to buy it anymore and you're going to need to know how to make it. So first of all is you need a can. Now you guys will recognize this can. You can buy them all over the place, especially in the holidays with all kinds of treats in there. Well, all you just get your can, you drill a hole in the, root, in the top of it, kind of like that. You stick it in the fire. And you burn all this paint and lacquer off of it. You don't want that in your medicine. So burn, just leave it in the fire until all that gets burned off. And then just kind of scrub it out. And it's ready to go. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your sticks. Now, we 
use Willow most of the time just because it's easily available to us. It's a soft wood and it works really well. And so we use Willow. I have used Eucalyptus. Mrs. White talks about using Eucalyptus because she was in Australia when she wrote that. And I guess that was really available. Well, we have eucalyptus on our property in Mariposa. And so I made some out of eucalyptus thinking maybe this is extra special wood. But it didn't work any different than my, than my willow. So we've kind of gone back to willow. But I do have a whole jar of uh, eucalyptus charcoal. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be eucalyptus. But anyway. So we get our sticks. Let's see, where are my big sticks? I was going to show you those first. I guess I... You don't want to use conifers like um, like something that has like pine and firs that have a lot of pitch in them because they're going to get all gummed up. So try to avoid those. And you don't want to use like um, cherry wood from like a cherry tree because it has cyanide in it. You don't want to use elderberry wood because it has cyanide in it. So make sure you know your woods. But you can use ash you can use willow, you can use cottonwood, you could use, what else could they use? They probably got a lot of soft maple up here. Soft maple. So there's a lot of woods that you can, different kinds of woods you can use. Just, um, just be careful, make sure you, you know what kind of wood you're using. Don't just pick any old thing. Alder, my husband says alder good, if you have alder around here. So you might need to learn about trees a little bit, if you don't know about trees. What about aspen? About aspen? Yeah, aspen should be is that a soft wood? It's, yeah, it's like soft wood. Okay. If you can push your thumbnail in it, usually it's a soft wood. So I can give it the thumbnail test to see if it's a soft wood. Okay, so this is a piece of willow. A lot of times we, paint, we, we cut some willow when we're doing our classes, and um, we have people carve spoons and other things out of them. And um, we, I just let it. And then we split it into little sticks like this. The tin, like that. See there? All filled up with little sticks. Can you guys see that? Okay. Then what you do is you put your lid on. That has a hole in it. Remember the hole in the top of the lid? And you have your fire going outside. And you put that in your fire with coals under it and put some coals around the outside of it and just watch it. Now you're going to see some flame and some smoke coming out of the top of that hole. And just leave it there until there is no longer smoke or flame coming off the top. And when there's no longer any smoke or flame, then I usually take a stick or something and I give it a little tap because a lot of times it's more when you do that for something's stuck to it or something. And then when there's no longer anything coming out of it, then it's done. You just take your tongs and take it out. Don't open it right away. If you open it, it's going to burst into flame and your stick will just burn up. So just leave it closed until it cools. And when it's all cool, it's going to look like this. Your little sticks. Can you see them in there? I'm just going to pull them out so you can see them better. But just little sticks like that. And if you're an artist, you can draw with those. <laughs> A lot of artists buy these charcoal sticks for drawing. But um, these are your little sticks. And then that little grinder that Jim was using for his, um, this little corn grinder, we just put him through that and grind him up and make a nice powder. My powder is almost gone here. I need to do some more. Okay? And that's ready to use. Usually keep several jars handy. Okay? So that's how you make medicinal charcoal. That works very good. I would always keep some on hand. It's good for, um, in fact, just this week while we were at my brother's, um, I'm sorry, what? Oh, sure. And this one, too. So just this week, we were at my brother's house. A friend from Mariposa called me and said that her, her puppy got bit by a rattlesnake. And she says, I put a charcoal poultice on it right away, and but I'm not sure if I should do something else. I says, well, if you can get me to take some charcoal by mouth, it might be good. He got bit, like, on the mouth. His mouth was swollen and he was drooling. And so she changed the charcoal poultice every 15 minutes at first to get try to pull that poison out. Now, charcoal is, doesn't absorb like with an AB. It adsorbs. And so what it does, it, um, the stuff will stick to the wood. It'll stick to the charcoal and hold on to it. 
And then when you change it, you get rid of all that, and you put a new one, then it's going to, some more stuff's going to come and stick to it. And so all that poison just sticks to that poison bacteria, all that kind of stuff. It'll just stick to that wood, and it draws it out of the wound. And so that's what she was doing. And I haven't heard the latest, but last I heard, he was doing a lot better. He wasn't crying anymore. The swelling had gone down, and he wasn't drooling. So it works. Um, we had... Uh, well, we didn't know these people. We knew some people that knew the people. There were some mushroom people that loved to go camping, pick the wild mushrooms, and eat them. They were supposedly mushroom experts of wild mushrooms. And so um, they were out camping, doing one of their mushroom things, and they ate some mushrooms, and they realized very shortly they ate something they shouldn't have eaten. They started getting very, very sick very, very quickly. Well, they, their phones worked, so they called 911, but they were too sick to even walk. They were really sick. So they crawled over to their campfire from the night before, and they started eating the charcoal from their campfire. When the paramedics got there, they said that saved their lives. If they hadn't eaten that, they probably would have been dead when they got there. But eating that charcoal saved their lives. So a lot of times we think we have to have this special charcoal. You can take the charcoal right out of your fire pit from the night before, and you can eat that in emergency, okay? And it may save your life or somebody else's life. Um, <clears throat> have I convinced you yet that you need to know how to use charcoal? <laughs> okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is there's more than one way to use charcoal. Another way you can do it is making, um, we talked about poultices. Um, does everybody know how to make a poultice? Yeah. Huh. Tell him anyway. Okay, he says I should tell you anyway. Okay, so to make a poultice, you take some charcoal and you put it in a. Okay, I'll just make some. So you take the charcoal. I have a little jar here. I can find a little spoon. Somewhere there's got to be a spoon. <laughs> Dish towels, silverware. you have a plastic one? That's better. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to put a little bit of charcoal in here. I'm going to do it over the sink because it's pretty messy. So just over here, I'm just going to take a spoonful of charcoal. And I'm going to add some water to it. Okay, so I know this is a shot glass, but I bought this. I saw this at a truck stop when we were going through. I go, that'd be perfect for my charcoal. So I bought it. I put the lid on it and I shake it up. Now I used to put it in a little cup and then stir it. Well, it's powdery, very fine, and it'll the powder, the dust will, fall, and you don't want to breathe that. I was doing a class once, and there was a guy in there who was a respiratory specialist. Respiratory, respiratory anesthesiologist. And he told me, he says, if you get that charcoal in your lungs, it's always there. It's never going to go away. And he says, what happens is people take those capsules, the charcoal capsules, they take those. Sometimes they dissolve before they swallow them, and then they breathe it into their lungs. And it's not good for you. So I don't use charcoal ta capsules, capsules, but um, a lot of people do. But he didn't recommend those because he sees the lungs and what it does to them. So anyway, so I don't want to breathe that either when I'm mixing it. So I put it in my little jar. My little lid clamps down really tight, and I just shake it up. Now I put, um, this has quite a bit of water in it, so it's pretty runny. So this is what we call a charcoal slurry. And so the way to use a charcoal slurry, like, Let's say you went out to dinner and you come home and your stomach is like, oh, no, I ate something that I shouldn't have eaten. And pretty soon you've got diarrhea. Or you started vomiting or you're feeling very nauseous. 
Okay, you make us off the charcoal slurry and drink it down. It doesn't taste bad. It's a little bit gritty depending on how fine you make your charcoal, but it works wonders. A word of caution, if you take a medication, if you're on medication, you need to not take it um, two out, and is it an hour or two hours? Two hours before or two hours after your medication because it'll also absorb your medication. And then it's not, you're not going to get your full dose. So two hours before or two hours after your medication, if you're on medication. Okay? So you take that and you drink it down. And even if you vomit some of it back up, that's okay. Wait a few hours and take another one. All right? You're going to absorb some of it anyway. And then usually in just a short time, you'll be back to normal. You can overdose on charcoal. If you, um, I'll tell you a story about my mother-in-law. We took care of my mother-in-law for the last 10 years. Um, she passed away, well, a little bit. It, it, we took care of her for 10 years. She passed away, I guess, two years ago now. Almost two years. Anyway, she was 97 when she passed away. But she came to me one night. She says, Becky, can you make me some charcoal slurry? I've got kind of a little diarrhea. And so I said, sure. So I made her a slurry. She drank it down, and I thought she went to bed. And I went to bed shortly after that, too, went back to my room. Well, a couple days later, she comes and says, that charcoal sure got me plugged up. Now I can't go to the bathroom. And I'm like, well, it shouldn't have. You only got a spoonful. She goes, well, after you went to bed, I thought you didn't give me enough. So I went and made myself another one. And so she made herself another one and used a, used a quarter of a cup of charcoal. Oh, and she was so constipated, she couldn't use the bathroom. So we really started pushing the water and some prune juice and everything we could think of. And pretty soon she was, she was working <laughs> normal again. So charcoal is a medicine. You don't want to overdose on it any more than you would any other medicine you take. You know, you need to take it wisely. Use it wisely. Um, <clears throat> some years ago, I had a, a tendonitis in my shoulder, and I couldn't lift my arm. And so the doctor, were, one of the doctors where I worked, he injected it with the cortisone stuff. And right when he sh gave me the injection, I thought, oh, he didn't clean my skin first, that rascal. Naughty doctor. I was so mad. Well, to say the least, you know, this is a medical center. <laughs> And I work in wound care. That's where I was working. So I see all kinds of nasties. And sure enough, I got an infection in my shoulder. And so then they gave me antibiotics, which I don't tolerate very well. But I took them. I was a good patient. And, you know, I've got that. So we switched them to a different one. And it's just kept, kept switching me. I couldn't, couldn't eat anything. It's right back go right through and so sick they were giving me IV fluids I was so dehydrated and I just like okay Becky you know better than I went home and I made myself little things I drank it down about two three hours later I made another one and drank it down problem solved okay back to normal Charcoal is marvelous. Ms. White talks about using charcoal. And when people can't have medicine, this can save somebody's life. So please make charcoal. Now, if I wanted to use a poultice instead of a slurry, does anybody want to drink my slurry? Anybody have a sore throat or anything like that? No, no takers. Okay. So I would just make it a little thicker so it's more of a paste. Now, you can also make these ahead of time. And like put some flaxseed with it or some lecithin with it. Put it on a saran wrap and stick it in your freezer. Put it in a put it in a little Ziploc baggie, you know, like those um, little um, gallon-sized Ziplocs. You can put it in there and then lay it flat and put it in your freezer and freeze it. And then when you need a poultice, it's ready to go. Just take it out of the freezer, cut out however big a piece you need. Cut off the plastic from one side and put it on wherever you're putting it, and it's ready to go. So it's ready to go. I don't usually put the flaxseed with mine because I make them right when I'm ready to use them. 
But if you want something made ahead of time, you could use that. And you can also make big ones to go across your back if you had a kidney infection or some other stuff going on, some big problems going on. You can make some larger ones. And so, but charcoal, it really is marvelous. And so um, the main thing about the reason they use the flax seed or the lithocin is to keep it moist because it doesn't work if it dry, if it dries out. You have to keep it moist. This is dripping. That's my lid's not sealing. Okay, so <clears throat> did I cover everything? Well, let me look at my notes, see what I forgot. Okay. I talk fast, especially when I get nervous, sorry. Yes. Oh, it's just the tin has comes with lead. The tin. Oh yeah, the one with the paint. Where'd I put it? it came like this. It comes like all kinds of stuff in them. You know, you can get tins all. Just make sure it's aluminum. Make sure it's tin. Pardon? Yeah, and how they were little like cookies and candies and all kinds of stuff, especially at the holidays. It doesn't have to be this shape. You can have a flat round one, you know, one of those things. Um, but then you want to put it in the fire and you want to burn all this paint and lacquer off because you don't want to have that in your mouth. That would be really good for you. No, a lot of them have um, they got this lacquer in it too. So... You would want to burn inside and outside. And after they're burnt inside, they'll have this um, kind of a dull, a dull look to them. Well, this it's kind of hard to tell because I got it full of stuff. But let me see if I can find one here. Yeah, the inside's all dulled inside. Can you see that? It's black, but it's not shiny anymore. This one's all shiny inside. You want to burn that out of there. I'll fix that later. <laughs> okay, so um, any, oh, yeah, in here. Um, so before, before oh, the, the put it in the Vitamix and whiz it up? I've never tried it. You could try it, I guess. Hope you don't break your Vitamix. We tried putting it in a blender once. A Vitamix is an extra powerful blender, though. Yeah, that, that would, no, don't take the lid off. That would take a long time. Yeah, let it settle for a long time. Oh, yeah. No, we took the lid off. Horrible mess. <laughs> Choco is messy. But it works wonders. Um, <clears throat> I've also used them for like an abscess tooth. I just make a little charcoal poultice and put it in like a little two by two um, gauze and stick it down in my jaw. It took a while to heal because it was in the bone, but also because I wasn't doing it, you know, around the clock because I was working, so I could only do it part of the day. But um, it will work, but it just takes longer. But Charcoal really does work really well. But um, I would suggest learn as many about as much as you can about natural remedies. But be sure and study everything out. Um, there's some stuff going around now that um, supposedly is safe that I disagree with. I'll let you make your own decisions about stuff. But um, there's a lot of plants that are really useful for lots of different things. And hot and cold treatments also are really good for natural remedies. You can use those all kinds of ways. Um, a lot of people are into these diffusers. Um, I know my mother-in-law was using one pretty regularly at our house for when someone introduced her to them, and she had it going pretty much 24-7, her diffuser out. And the air was thick with the smell of the, I don't know, whatever she had in it. I noticed my cat was just kind of lethargic and laying around. I thought, what is the matter with Kitty? Because he's not usually like that. And so I got online and I started Googling about these diffusers and all of these um, 
um, essential oils that they're using in them. And it was talking about, I found a site that was talking about how detrimental they are for dogs. They can make your dogs really sick. They're much more sensitive to smells and stuff than we are. And also, some of them are very detrimental to cats also. So we talked to mother, turned it off. In a couple of days, my cat was back to normal. But he did not like that strong smell in the house. It was making him sick. So... And I have a lot of allergies, so I notice when people have them on, a lot of times my nose starts running and I get very congested too. My throat gets hoarse because of the diffusers. Depends on, depends on what they have going on in them. But some, some of them don't bother me, some of them do. Another way, some, some natural remedies are really good, like, um, like mint is really good you know, to breathe that in and it's good for your sinuses and stuff like that. And thyme, thyme is really good. Um, if you're congested, you can take some thyme just out of your garden, put it in a pan of water, put it on the stove, bring it to a boil, and just put a towel over your head and breathe in that steam, and it'll open up your sinuses and clear them out. So there's a lot of things that are really good. Just make sure you do your due diligence and do your research on them and find out. Not just one site, but look at quite a few different sites and see if anyone's had some bad reactions. Because some of this stuff, and some of this stuff you shouldn't take with your medicines. You know, it depends on what kind of medication you're taking. So don't just go natural remedy. It's all safe. It's not. So anyway, so you need to be really careful. So is there any other question? I have a question. Yes. What was wrong with coniferous trees? <laughs> I'm sorry? It just has a lot of pitch in there, a lot of sap. And so that can make it gum up a little bit. Okay. So it's not that the wood is bad. It's just that the pitch will make it kind of gooey, you know. <laughs> and it probably depends on which wood you get. If you get some that's not got too much pitch in it, it might be all right. So I just, there's so much other woods available, I just avoid it for that reason. Yes. Yes, you can. But you're, you're eating the charcoal, not the ash. You understand the difference, right? right. Not, the, not the gray stuff, the black stuff. Yes. So you mentioned two woods that we have up here, one being elderberry that's not good. There's no, el elder, yeah, elderberry's not good. It has cyanide. And what was the other one? There's pop popular ash. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no. The other one? Yeah. Cherry. Cherry wood. Oh, cherry's not good. Cherry wood both have cyanide in them. I know they make like wooden spoons for cooking and stuff out of cherry wood. So it must not be too much of a problem. I wouldn't use it. <laughs> so I thought it was, you know, it would, uh, the heat might totally change the chemistry. It would not be a problem at all. But there's other woods, you know, use them. Over here, she was first. They have it at Amazon, you can buy it. <laughs> well, okay, now we could put this out in the fire if you wanted to see it burn. You guys want to see it burn? <laughs> okay, let me get it full, and we'll go take it and stick it in the fire. Huh? Sure. And you can get more pictures while it's burning, while it's cooking. So we're going to put this in the fire. On the bricks out there. See the see those sticks in the can. <clears throat> there was another question over here. Where was it? I was told you can just pick up red little charcoal off the side of the road or mountain road or wherever when they're after a forest fire. Oh, probably after a fire. Yeah, you probably could because it's just burnt trees. Yeah, so that would be fine. Yeah, you could do that. Okay, so we're going to go outside and put this in the fire if you want to follow me out. 
Oh, I'll talk about that too when we get out there. <laughs> you kiss him. <laughs> Those are wonderful. I have, I have the, the out the answer sheet. Can you guys smell the food out here? Oh, yeah. Yep. Shall we peek and see if it's done? Yeah. Okay. Let's stick. So cool. <laughs> you know your uh, trivet, your folding trivet. You can also use that as a lid. Uh, as a what? Lid holder. Oh, yeah. yeah no, we're your lid off oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't bring all my toys with me, just some of them. Okay, okay so we're going to just take this and we're going to put it right in here. What? Will it take a while for it to catch fire? Well, we'll see. This isn't a very big fire, but we'll see what it does here. Yeah, it's kind of border. It's going to cook. Look at there. See the smoke starting to come out the top already? Okay, it's already starting to smoke a little bit, if you can see that. You're going to cut them. They're not hard to cut. Sure. Okay, so let's see if this is done. We'll take a peek. Um, depends on your weather. I painted it with green because I had to do it right away. I was demonstrating something. We went and cut it and cooked it down. Ooh, that looks good, huh? Wow. Is that done? I'm going to get my knife. I should have got my knife out before I opened it. Oh, if I can get to my knife, I got my thing sticking on it. Okay, let's see if it's done. Oh, I think we're done. Put those briquettes over on the charcoal. Let's take a look at our potatoes and see how they look. You hold that for me. Drop, yeah. Hold the top because the bottom might be hot. I have two tripods for my dad. Potatoes are not quite ready, almost. So what we're gonna do? You hand that to my husband, please. Carefully, don't cut yourself. It's very sharp. You can set it on the ground. You don't have to keep holding it. I'm sorry. I should have told you that. <laughs> He's a good boy. That's amazing how fast that started. Yeah, it should be going a little bit faster than that. Jim, bring me a few more briquettes over there, please. I don't think we have quite enough going there. And 
until there's no longer smoke or flame coming out of there. Pardon? Why don't you just take the charcoal for kids and smash them and use them? <laughs> First place, these have fuel in them. And I don't think we want fuel in our, in our, <laughs> these are light match ones. But I don't know that the other ones would be safe anyway. I don't know. But I know Mrs. White told um, someone they could use the charcoal from their, um, <clears throat> from the blacksmith, Jim. My lighter. Your lighter? <laughs> Thanks. We'll get these going a little bit and then we'll move them over. That should be enough to finish our job. Thanks. Okay, so the cobbler's ready. The, the potatoes aren't quite ready. We'll give them a little bit longer. And we need a little hotter fire for over here, so. Just get those going a little bit. We'll move them around there. <clears throat> now, if I had a campfire here, we usually make like an elongated fire pit. We'll have our campfire here, and then down there is where we're cooking our stuff at the other end. We'll just bring out what coals we need from down there and then put it around. Um, yes, I'm not sure exactly what you're calling reflector fire, but yeah, when we camp fire, we try to make reflector fires with a rock wall or something. <coughs> Sorry, I just took a big breath of smoke. So, um, we had some people that came to one of our programs. They had made a little solar stove they were trying to use. You guys heard of those? Little solar stove. This little box they had. It was all in, in foil or something. And they were trying to cook some food in the solar fire. Well, that particular day, we kind of had clouds part of the day. They were all day. Never did get that food to cook. I felt kind of sorry for them because they could have just done a Dutch oven and they would have had their food in an hour. You know, so... <clears throat> And then later on, a few years later, we had somebody else come with us with a solar stove and they had it. He had it actually sitting on the back of his truck and it did fine. But I found out later they were just warming their food. It was already pre-cooked. So they were just warming it in there and it did fine. So I don't know about, about solar stoves, how well they work. Want to do a commercial? <laughs> oh, yeah, I should tell them about the books, too. OK, so I'll do a commercial. <laughs> you want to call it that <clears throat> we have this little book we put together um, well Jim put it together um, basic wilderness survival skills it has some well edible plants in there a lot of the stuff you've been learning this weekend plus a lot more anyway this is um, basic wilderness survival by Jim Bowler from an end time Christian perspective so there's this um, we sell these for 12 bucks if you want one and then this little book here is called A Letter to a Young Christian, 
how Cretish Christianity works for me. And a few years ago, our oldest granddaughter got baptized and we could not go to her baptism. And so my husband wrote her a letter. That's what this was. And it's just a little letter for a young Christian to help them grow their Christian experience. Well, the letter turned into a book. But... Yeah, it was a letter that turned into a book. And so the front of it is dedicated to, to Talia. But and anyway, so anyway, we sell these for three dollars. So that's what it costs us to print them. Okay. We do. We have these so we with us. We have too many of the letters to young Christians. We have quite a few of those. We'll we have quite a few of these. Oh, anyway, we have some of these. We have a bunch of these. So, did you get your picture? Okay. Sorry, I was wiggling. <clears throat> okay. So, we do. No. You can order those from these services. Yeah. I know. I have that. Where else do you know? What is it? I'm sorry, what? We do have a website. Um, the website is um, www.preparingtostand.org. It's at the bottom of one of the pages of uh, the, study, the, the study guide that we did uh, Friday night. I know what's on that one. Uh, those study guides we did yesterday, I'm not sure if it's on those. Maybe the last one we did. <laughs> we also have flint and steel kits that we sell, but I'll tell you about those tomorrow. Well, they might not be here tomorrow. You want to go ahead and tell them now? You're waiting for Are you guys going to be here tomorrow? <laughs> what? Well, go bring me my stuff in the door of the truck. <clears throat> yes, tomorrow we're done at noon. I'm just going to move that over so I don't trip on it. I have a tendency to wiggle. This nurse would have to pick up that nurse. I'm pretty heavy. <laughs> oh, looks like our briquettes are going. Let's. Let's kind of space them around here a little bit more now. If we can get our charcoal to cook a little more. Not what I want the, my, my kit out of the door of the truck. <laughs> Husbands. So this is a flint and steel kit, and did you come to help me, Brother Joe? No. This is my wonderful brother. brother. <laughs> this is my wonderful brother that I don't get to see, but once in a great blue moon. Yeah, you can hold that for me since you came up here. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so this is a rock. See there? I have a rock. This is a um, steel striker made out of a garage spring door that my husband made on the blacksmith shop. <clears throat> this is um, a little tin with some charred cloth in it. Let me have some of this. Uh -huh. This is a tinder bundle. And I will need a little helper. You want to? <laughs> I thought he looked Showed eager. Right Hold it just time. like that for me. Okay. And so <clears throat> we're going to take a little piece of this charred cloth here. Let me get a little bigger piece. Uh, we're going to demonstrate this more tomorrow. Okay. So stand over here so people can see. 
There you go. And I'm going to use my little striker here to make a spark to light my charred cloth, okay? Just like that. See there? We're going to put that down here in there like so. Okay, hold it just like this and blow it to flame. Hold it above your face. Because if it goes to flame, we don't want his um, face to get burned. Ooh, good job. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and put it in the on top of the Dutch oven right there. Give him a hand. Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> so that's how you make fire with a flint and steel kit. Now, the reason that we use this style of fire making, it's my favorite, both of our favorite fire, fire making methods, is because this can be used until Jesus comes. It's not going to wear out. It's sustainable in the wilderness forever. Yeah. And it's been a tried and true method for many, many generations. How much is it? How much is it? <laughs> well, this one was free. We made it. Yeah. <laughs> We do sell them. I'll get to that later. Okay, so anyway, so um, <clears throat> I also in here I have some pitch wood. You guys know what pitch wood or fat wood is? So if I have a fire, I'm trying to make and it's wet outside. It's been raining for decades or days and days and days. We did a program up here in Idaho one year. Where was that at in Idaho? It was up by Priest River. Up by Priest River. And with our program, it rained for the full 10 days we were there. Yeah, I believe it. just rained and rained and rained. And we, we, <laughs> and we had a awful time getting our first fire going. But we finally got it going. And then we just kept bringing food, food, bringing wood around and drying it by the fire so to be ready for our next fire. So we had to learn. But pitch wood, if everything's wet, it'll still burn. So. So, anyway, so, um, but with this method now, I know I have charred cloth in here. I was going to ask about what kind of cloth is it? It's cotton. Okay. Um, we often make it out of old jeans. Make sure they're not a stretch denim because then they have like a polyester or synthetic fibers. You don't want that. You want 100% cotton or linen. Now, of course, when I'm out in the woods, I'm not going to have this. I don't want to be tearing up my pants and burning them. So... <clears throat> But you can use punk wood. You know what? I mean, I got, it's that dry, spongy, that dead spongy wood in the forest. It's called punk wood. That's what we call it. You guys know what that is? Yeah, it's kind of spongy. You can put that in your tin and char that. And it'll start, it'll do the work the same as the charred cloth. And so it's available to you until Jesus comes. Now, a lot of people like... Um, those ferro rods nowadays well eventually that's going to be all used up and you're not going to have it anymore it's going to quit and <clears throat> so we recommend this method because it's sustainable i have this little striker here it's going to last through my lifetime and probably my daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters and whatever it's not going to keep working a little bit gets shaved off but it's going to work for a long long time so anyway <clears throat> so that's what we recommend but um Either way, um, whatever fire method you choose, you need to make sure that you know how to use it. If you can't make a fire in your backyard on a nice sunny day like today, I guarantee you're not going to make it up in the mountains in the cold and the dark and the wet. So whatever method you choose, you, have to, you need to practice. And to be honest, I carry more than one way of making fire. I know how to make fire with a bow drill. We'll be demonstrating that tomorrow. And also a lighter. I carry a lighter with me also. So there's, it's good to carry more than one way to make fire. I mean, how much does a lighter weigh? You can throw that in with whatever method you have, and you have at least a few fires out of that before it runs out of fuel. And you could use that when you don't have time to do this. Although this, you could see, didn't take very long, did it? It was pretty quick. Of course, I have a good skill level built up. I've been doing this for a long time. It might take you a little while to get your first fire. So...
Well, I don't know. It hasn't been that much longer since we did them. Tell them how much that costs for Oh, these are 35 bucks. This one's made with elk. Most of the ones, the ones I'm selling, I think, are with deer. That's wonderful. Hand sewn by Becky. Yeah. They're all handmade. The strikers in those are not the ones that Jim made. They're a little different. Um, he hasn't been able to get any made lately. And so we have a, we have a knife maker friend in Idaho, actually. Lives down in Elk City. Christopher lives down in Elk City. Christopher, Christopher Fisher lives in, he's an Adventist. That lives down in Elk City. He's a knife maker friend of ours. He also makes a knife called the PTS, Preparing to Stand Bush Knife. The PTS Bush Knife that him and my husband designed. And he also makes that and sells that too. But um, he makes all kinds of knives. Anyway, he knew someone that knew how to punch, that had them, uh, had what he needed to punch out the strikers instead of uh, you know, through a laser cut or something. I don't know how it works. But anyway, so he made us a bunch that way instead of on the forge. And um, just hand that to Jim. It's not tied shut, don't lose my stuff. And so, um, anyway, so so we paid him to make those for us. So our last 50 strikers we got from him because we didn't have time to make any. And people kept asking us, where can we get a flint and steel kit? And we go, well, we don't have any. We haven't had time. And they're like, well, we want one. How do we get one? So anyway, so because of that, we have Fisher. Christopher has been making some for us and and sending them out to us. And so we had to up our prices a little bit because we have to pay for those. So <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so this is the bush knife that he makes. He just sent us this new one. It's an awesome knife. We haven't even used this one yet. We just got it. But um, it's got, um, it's flat here. So you can do some small carving. You want to keep this area edge here really nice and sharp for some small carving. And then this edge down here isn't quite as sharp and it's more rounded. So you can do some mallet and um, chopping with that edge. And so anyway, this is the PTS book knife. I mean, BTS bush knife. And um, I don't know what he charges for them. I think he does sell them in different stages. Like if you are a crafty person who had to make stuff, he can make the knife blade for you. And then you can put on your own handle if you want. He'll charge you less for it. Or he can make it complete, just like this, with a, with even this, with even the sheath. And you're going to pay a lot more for it. And it's not going to be cheap. I can guarantee that. So, anyway. But, oh, oh, 70-ish, my husband says for these. But um, we can, um, tomorrow we'll talk more about equipment and what kind of equipment you should have in your grab-and-go bag. Do you guys have grab-and-go bags? How many of you have grab-and-go bags? Some of you. Not all of you, but some of you. Huh? I have everything. It's not really organized. Okay, we went to, there's been some programs we've gone to, and then we go back several years later. We had this one we had been to there, and um, we went back. It was like three or four years later, and she comes up. Oh, look, look, I've got my grab-and-go bag ready. She was so excited. We go, oh, good, show it to us. She starts pulling stuff out, still in its packaging. <laughs> and we're like, oh, our hearts just sank. What does it tell you when it's still in its packaging? She have not tried it out. She doesn't know how to use any of it. It's just in the bag. Plus, when she goes to the mountains, what's she going to do with all that trash that she's carrying, that plastic that everything's wrapped in, you know? So if you get, if you get your pack ready, take it out of the packaging, and try using all of your stuff, even if it's in your backyard, and learn how to use your equipment. Don't wait till you go flee to use your equipment. Tomorrow you're going to tell what to put in the grab-and-go bag? Yes. 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 Tomorrow we're going to talk about fire starting and uh, survival kit equipment. Those are the two main topics. You think the potatoes well, are done? It's almost over. Look at the clock. Well, that's because you talked so long. Okay. <coughs> oh yeah, make it the same way you do the the, the charcoal. Oh. I got.
holes there. That's what my problem is. There we go. Well, it's very fragile. So, yeah, it'll fall apart. You have to be careful with it. Yeah, the charged cloth, you make the same way we're making the medicinal charcoal. Same process. You're just here, you're charring wood. And, oh, and I need my, I need my knife. Thanks. I think we can eat. <clears throat> hey, Jim, my little trivet is in. Oh no, yeah, it's inside. Could you go get it and put my lid on, please? No, that's just the tongs. Our, our medicinal charcoal is not cooking very well. It should be done by now. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got lots of garlic in it. It is medicinal. <laughs> garlic potatoes. <clears throat> so. <laughs> so we have, um, usually I make three pots if I'm going to cook. We thought there's going to be 150 people here. So we thought, well, there's no need to cook for 150 people. We don't have enough food for that many people. So I was just going to tell you how to use it. So I only brought the two pots, but then since our group has shrunk today, we thought, well, let's go ahead and cook. We're glad. It's more fun when you cook and you get to eat the food. What would you do in the three pots? You do the well, I usually make like an enchilada casserole or a lasagna or something like that in there. It's just really yummy yeah. too. Yeah. Actually, be nice if I had my whisper room, but I didn't bring it, so we'll just do that, let it cool. My little whisk room. Actually, I might have it with me. It might be in my um, stuff up there. Yeah, I'll just put it there, I guess. <clears throat> Come on out of there. Okay, so um, do we have plates and forks? Okay, and um, I have some serving stuff in my... Um, Oh, no, I don't want to use metal in there. I have some stuff in my truck. Those look good, huh? Oh, that's starting to, to burn from being close to that over there. <clears throat> huh, look at that. That side started burning, being too close to another fire. Let's move it over here. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit in my chair and dish up. How's that? Are okay, you going to pass it out? I'm gonna so, <coughs> we've got quite a few people. So you're only going to get a few yeah, bites at first bites. until everybody gets some. And then you, if there's more, you can come back for seconds, okay? You just basically get a taste until everybody gets some. Well, this isn't working very well. Can I help you? Sure, of course. Okay, but you need to, this is like a nut topping, so you need to go all the way down, so they get blueberries and... Okay. 
Okay. Here, let me just put this on, then I'll hand it to you, and we'll do an assembly line. How's that? Potatoes could be just a little bit done or they'll put it over here, not on top of the I have a question in regards to this. Can you put a patch of of cotton cloth in with this when you're doing your charcoal? And that way you make it your chart uh, fabric for your your uh, fire starter along with this or is it better to keep it? Well, I don't know your um We'll hand it to you dear. The, um, <coughs> keeps falling off. Where'd she go? Here, somebody. Where'd you go? Have some more of the white potatoes. I love white potatoes. Yeah. Over there. That's it, because everyone has to get some. We're going to take off. Okay. You want to take a little cobbler with you? Okay. All right. See you at home. See ya. I'm glad that you got to see your brother. Me too. I mean, it sounds like you have a good friendship and you just don't get to see. Well, you know what? I don't really need this on anymore. We have a uh, blessing for the food. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for providing for our every need, including this food. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon it, that it will bless us. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the potatoes could have cooked a little bit more, but...